Good morning and welcome to Keystone Church Online. My name is Lauren Foster. This is my beautiful wife, Lauren, and we pastor here at Keystone Church. And we just wanted to take a minute to let you know what you can expect here with Church Online, if, especially if this is your first time joining us. The heart of our church is to make every person feel welcome. And so part of what you'll see this morning is a glimpse into our home because we want you to feel like you've been welcomed home into our church family. And if you're encouraged or you're a part of our church family already and you'd like to give towards supporting the vision as we advance the gospel in our community and beyond, on our website, keystonechurchpa.com, there's some different options in which you can give and support the ministry. We're so glad that you're here today and hope this message encourages you with the hope of Jesus. Parables, we're jumping in. We're going to be looking at Mark chapter 4, verses 1 through 20. These parables that we're going to be talking through over the course of the summer, these are life stories from Jesus, and we're going to see how they apply to our lives today. Let's just jump right into it. Mark 4, starting in verse 1, here's what it says. Once again, Jesus began teaching by the lake shore. A very large crowd soon gathered around him, so he got into a boat. Then he sat in the boat while all the people remained on the shore. He taught them by telling many stories in the form of parables, such as this one. Listen, a farmer went out to plant some seed. As he scattered it across the field, some of the seed fell on a footpath and the birds came and ate it. Other seed fell on shallow soil with underlying rock. The seed sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow, but the plant soon wilted under the hot sun, and since it didn't have deep roots, it died. Other seed fell among thorns that grew up and choked out the tender plant, so they produced no grain. Still other seeds fell on fertile soil, and they sprouted, grew, and produced a crop that was 30, 60, and even 100 times as much as had been planted. Then he said, anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Later, when Jesus was alone with the twelve disciples and with the others who were gathered around, they asked him what the parables meant. I love this. The disciples said, we didn't get it the first time. Jesus, can you please, please explain it? He replied, you are permitted to understand the secret of the kingdom of God, but I use parables for everything I say to outsiders so that the scriptures might be fulfilled. When they see what I do, they'll learn nothing. When they hear what I say, they will not understand. Otherwise, they will turn to me and be forgiven. Then Jesus said to them, if you can't understand the meaning of this parable, how will you understand all the other parables? The farmer plants seed by taking God's word to others. The seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message only to have Satan come at once and take it away. The seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy, but since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's word. The seed that fell among the thorns represents others who hear God's word, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the worries of this life, the lure of wealth, and the desire for other things, so no fruit is produced. And the seed that fell on good soil, everybody say good soil, soil. represents those who hear and accept God's word and produce a harvest of 30, 60, or even 100 times as much as had been planted. Let's pray one more time here this morning. Lord, thank you for the opportunity that we have to open up your word. Help us to see your truth. Help us to not only see it, but receive it and apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so here's a question. In light of this parable that we just read that I would like all of us to consider here this morning, what kind of soil would describe your heart? What kind of soil would describe your heart? When we lived in the South, when we lived in Arkansas, uh, there was one particular year uh, we wanted to plant a garden. And having never planted a garden before, we, we, we really didn't approach it with a whole lot of wisdom. So we started to sprout some of the seeds indoors like you're, you're, you know, you're, you're taught to do and then transplant that into the ground. Well, we didn't really prepare the soil very well. We just kind of dug a hole, stuck the seed in there, watered it a little bit. And I mean, it is so hot in the South. Very quickly, those seeds got scorched. Those little, those little seedlings died quickly. And I was extremely frustrated by our first attempt. So I started to talk to some people. 
that actually knew what they were doing. Some family members, some friends that had grown gardens before. And they all would tell me, Foster, your problem is the soil. You've got to get some really good soil if you want your plants to grow. So I tilled up the hard ground in, in Arkansas. It was clay. It was just thick and the dirt was just it was difficult to try to grow something so tilled it up and I brought in something from this local landscaper they said this is super soil this is great soil topsoil mixed with all these nutrients and everything a plant needs like perfect so we get the topsoil and then I'm talking to other people they say you need to compost you need to get some good compost in your garden so I found out at the time if you were a master gardener in our community they would go to Starbucks and Starbucks they would have trash bags full of coffee grounds that they would save for people that wanted to compost and dump that in their garden. So I was, I became a freak. I would call every Starbucks in the community. Y'all got any coffee grounds? And, and they would hold some aside. So I'm hauling trash bags full of coffee grounds into my trunk of my car, dumping these all into my garden because I was consumed with just trying to produce and give my soil the best possible environment for these seeds, for these plants to grow. And then the second year, when we did it that way, our garden flourished compared to the first year. It wasn't great, but it was so much better. We even had a couple cherry tomato plants. And I remember going outside when I saw the first tomato on our tomato plant, I freaked out. I mean, I ran outside. I'm like, oh, it's, a, it's a tomato. We grew something. And I was so excited because really what had changed was simply the atmosphere that we had created for growth. So speaking of this parable and this story that Jesus told, what exactly is a parable? Why did Jesus preach and teach this way? Well, a parable is an earthly story or illustration that helps to draw out or go alongside a heavenly or an eternal meeting. And the word tells us that Jesus taught many things by parables. And I believe he did this because when it comes to a compelling story, that's just something that we can all relate to. When we hear an illustration that puts us in the place where we can understand and identify what's being shared, it's really the reason that we lean into certain movies, music. If you read a great book or a novel, it's like you are in it because some of the stories that are being told. Now, when it comes to Scripture, when it comes to the parables that Jesus taught, many of them were very neutral uh, and some were very controversial, in your face, direct. Jesus used metaphors, analogies, short stories from everyday life. I'd like to think that Jesus used some humor in his parables. We don't know this for sure, but I hope he threw in some dad jokes every once in a while, just because it just makes every story a little bit better. But if you want to know the spiritual reason behind parables that were taught in the New Testament, it was two, twofold. The first is that a parable will reveal the truth of the mystery of the kingdom of God. It means it reveals the truth behind scripture. But the second reason that a parable is shared is that it reveals the heart of the listener. It reveals the heart of the person that's actually hearing the parable being taught. It's why when we read God's word, we're not simply reading words off the pages. The word of God is actually reading us. Hebrews 4.12 says it like this, For the word of God is alive and powerful. It's sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. When we read God's word, uh, in, in a way, it's just like a mirror. When we're reading it, when we're hearing it being taught, we see us as we truly are when it comes to our walk with the Lord and where we're at in our life spiritually. And sometimes when we see that reflection, we may or may not like what we see, but that's what makes the word so powerful and alive. So Mark records at the beginning of this chapter that Jesus taught many things by parables. And before he even goes into the story, in verse 3, here's what Jesus says, listen. Now, I don't know, it, it, sometimes we can, we can breeze through Scripture and we can miss moments like that. But I'm telling you, if Jesus is telling us to listen, then what's about to be told, he's trying to let his listeners know, you need to pay attention to this. You need to make sure you're dialed in. 
We do this at home with our kids, Lauren and I, when we, when we really want them to pay attention. There's some things, you know, that are being said, and, you know, as a family, you might miss it from time to time, but when Lauren and I have something important to say, like, right, hey, guys, hey, every, pause your, whatever you're doing right now, take off your headphones, uh, put your phone down, pause the music, mom and dad have something important to say, please listen. Our kids have become so accustomed to it, they'll even do it to us sometimes. When they want to say something to us that they want us to, you know, pay attention, they'll say, okay, mom, dad, pay attention. And our daughter, she'll do something funny. She'll start saying something crazy just to test us. There's an elephant walking through the living room. Are you guys listening? And we know, okay, it's, it's, time, it's time to be dialed in. Pay attention. Jesus is emphasizing, before I even start sharing this parable, this is a life principle you're going to want to remember. And it's pretty fascinating because th- some theologians believe that when this parable was taught, Jesus was teaching from a natural amphitheater. In fact, Israeli scientists, they confirmed this, this location where Jesus taught this parable was in a location called the Bay of Parables. And what they found is because of the, the natural way uh, this location was made, you could easily project your voice to a few thousand people. So Jesus then starts talking about this illustration of a first century farmer scattering seed, which which would have been completely relevant to those that were listening. And when you read the story, the intention of the, the farmer, of the sower, is to produce a crop. But whether or not this is achieved depends on the condition of the soil which the seed falls. So he describes four kinds of soil. Here's here's where we're going to dig in. It says this, the first is the hard ground or the footpath, which represents a hardened, closed, or indifferent heart. Now actually categorically, this doesn't even make it on the list really as a soil because the seed never actually breaks the surface. Um, Scripture tells us that this is where the enemy, where Satan comes in, snatches the word before he even has a chance to germinate, to get under the surface, to actually grow. And I need to just say this, it's worth repeating, um, that there is an enemy out there that his sole intent is to steal, kill, and destroy. And he wants nothing more than to try to steal that word or the truth of God from your life before it ever has a chance to grow in your heart. This is a person that hears God's word and is almost completely uh, resisting the idea of God's truth before they even hear it. It's like coming into church, predetermining uh, whatever I hear I'm going to reject. Whatever truth I might even, may even sense that I'm going to see revealed, I'm not going to accept it. Man, I'll sit and I'll listen to some guy speak for 30 minutes, but I'm not really receiving or listening to anything that's being shared. It's a hardening, a stiffening where the word's being shared, but there's no breaking through. Ezekiel 33 verse 32 in the Old Testament speaks to this. Indeed to them, you are nothing more than one who sings love songs with a beautiful voice and plays an instrument well. For they hear your words, but do not put them into practice. So when it comes to God's word, here's something very practical that if you're taking notes, you can write down. The difference lies not in the hearing, but in how you hear. And not simply hearing God's word, but we're encouraged to obey God's word or to heed his word. And Jesus said it like this in John 14, 15. If you love me, obey my commandments. Here's what's amazing about God's word uh, is how that it has the ability. and it, it, It's powerful because it actually divides. Have you ever noticed that somebody can hear God's word? and they can be excited and find life in it. It's something that's happening in their heart that's changing them. And then somebody that's sitting in the exact same place can hear God's word and be frustrated, angry, or upset about what's being communicated. Remember, I came across something. This is the illustration that I thought of when when referencing this kind of person. 
I don't, it was six months ago on social media, something showed up on my feed where it was someone and it, either on a talk show or they were, they were sharing about some cultural topic. I don't even remember what it was, but they were infuriated that the other person in the discussion was using God's word as their foundation for the reason that they're living. And this person was so agitated by that, the clip that I saw was this person going on a rant. I don't care what the Word of God says. I don't care what the Bible says. I don't care what Jesus says. And it was just this, such a harsh, hard, you, could, you could sense this person is closed off. They're hardened. Even if they were to hear God's truth communicated, it's not going to penetrate the surface of their heart. So if you and I, if we understand how to receive God's word and how to prepare our heart in such a way that it will yield results, it's actually exciting because we can posture our heart. We can put ourselves in a position of faith where we come into any environment where we're hearing the word of God communicated. And it's like, Lord, I am ready to receive what you have for me today. Or if you're alone and you're reading the Word of God at your house on a Monday through Saturday or sometime that's outside of church, before you even open the Word of God. I remember having a friend, he asked me this question years ago. He said, how do you read the Bible? And, and, it was, and he, was, he was leading me somewhere. I'm like, what do you mean how do I read the Bible? He's like, what do you do? What's the first thing you do? I said, I open it. He's like, no. And he was mad. He's like, no, you don't do that. I was like, okay, what, what am I doing wrong? He said, you got to pray and ask that the Lord would reveal his truth to you as you read his word. I was like, that's really good. Before I even open the pages of the word, have I positioned my heart to receive what I'm about to read? What I'm about to receive? And it's, Lord, show me so that I can obey what you're revealing to me through your word. The second kind was shallow or rocky soil. Represents someone that's enthusiastic about the Lord but unstable in their faith. And Jesus goes on to say, because of problems of life, social pressure, persecution, adversity, this soil, excuse me, this seed withers. It, it doesn't take the root that's necessary to grow. I think that if I were to ask everybody to raise your hand, you, you probably know someone in your life or you've heard a story of someone that was following Jesus at some point but they've since left the faith for a variety of different reasons. Perhaps they were off to a really, really good start. Maybe they were filled with enthusiasm and excitement about serving the Lord, but it waned when adversity hit their life and hit their home. Mark 8, 34 and 35 says, Then calling the crowd to join his disciples, he said, If any of you wants to be my follower, these are the words of Jesus. You must give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you'll save it. This is, when I was studying this out this week, it's very hard for me because I, I have a pastor's heart. I, I, I love the story of uh, the 99, the, the one that's away from the 100 and, and, and running after and trying to rescue the one because I believe that's the heart of the Father that he's always pursuing us, always desiring that we would come back home. It's like the story of the prodigal son. I love that, that description of who our God is. But I've noticed over the years, there have been times I've tried to go after a brother or a sister that's fallen away from the faith. Maybe you've encountered this. Sometimes there are people they don't want to be found. And it's not because your efforts aren't, are lacking. It's that at some point we have to realize in our life we can't be the Savior for somebody else. They need to find Christ. They need Jesus to be the one that rescues them. So that can sometimes, we could, that can seem discouraging. We can put ourselves in a position where we continue to pray. We continue to believe God. Love them like Jesus. Let them know I am here for you. And we absolutely continue to pray for that person. I'm not telling you don't continue the pursuit. But there's something to be learned in this illustration of this soil. It's pray for that person that's far from the Lord. But it's also pray that your heart wouldn't come to the same place. It's like, Lord, let, let our heart not become hardened 
to who you are. The thorny soil represents someone that's distracted by worries, lust, concerns of this world. Now listen, I don't know much about gardening, uh, but I can tell you one thing that I do know is you have to get rid of the weeds, the debris, something that grows in the garden outside of the plant, because if you don't, what's going to happen is these distractions are going to choke the plant out and it's going to prevent it from getting the light and the nutrients that it needs to survive. And so what Jesus is really trying to lead his listeners towards is this, what's competing with the Lord right now for the space in your heart? I'll tell you, I used to be someone uh, that was a night owl. Does anybody like staying up late at night? You like to stay up late? Yeah, okay. My people, I understand. Some of you, you go to bed early and uh, I'm at that place now in my life and I love it. It's like, what do you want to do tonight? I want to go to sleep. That's what I want to do. That's a good night. You know what I'm saying? But I remember um, it was like there would be seasons where I'd come alive at night. I'd, I'd be up late. But then I also, I like to wake up early. But if you, if you know that kind of a rhythm, you can't stay up late every night and wake up early every morning. One of the two is going to win out, right? You're either going to go to bed earlier or you're going to wake up later. Something's going to change with your, your routine, with your cycle. And so I remember, there, I'm, I'm the person, if I'm going to spend time with the Lord, if I'm going to get in the Word, if I'm going to pray, it's going to happen in the morning. So I've got too many things going on during the day and into the evening that I'll get distracted, or I just, I, I won't want to do it. It's got to be first thing on the agenda. So I remember in those seasons where I would stay up super late and want to wake up every morning early, what was happening was something was going to end up being sacrificed. It's like, oh, well, I won't pray this morning. I won't get into God's word. I'll, I'll do it later in the day. And then if it doesn't happen or if it, consecutive days in a row, all of a sudden I'm recognizing I have some decisions to make. I, I have some adjustments, maybe a little bit of gardening that I need to do in my life because if, if I don't remove some of these things, I'm not going to grow the way I want to. In essence, I have to say no to some good things so that I can say yes to some better things. I heard a pastor say it like this, what you feed grows and what you starve dies. So again, a question, what do you need to feed in your life? Is there anything that you maybe need to starve? J.K. Chesterton once said, men do not differ much on what things they will call evils, but they differ enormously on what evils they will call excusable. What about personal level of worry? Where does that stand in your life today? And, and Jesus specifically addresses the worries and the cares of our daily lives. The things that can actually choke out the life of God that he actually desires for us. And uh, let me just tell you, if you surf the internet or turn on any news channel at all in our culture, especially today, I promise you there is going to be something that will try to bait you to start worrying about it. I'm not trying to say don't be disconnected from what's going on in our world or what's happening uh, in our culture today, but let's be honest. Sometimes we can let those things take up so much space in our life that they choke out the life of God. So what worries you the most reveals where you trust God the least. There's something in your life that you are constantly worried about. That's an indicator. Perhaps this area needs to grow. You need to learn how to trust the Lord more in this area of your life so that you would have the peace, you would have the rest, you would have the confidence that he promises. Here are a few areas. This is obviously not an exhaustive list, but politics, money, cultural issues, family, work. You could add to this list in your own life, and these categories in and of themselves, they are not bad. I'm not implying that you can't be interested in politics or how to make some extra income or how to climb the career ladder at your organization. It's when those areas of our heart start to choke out the word of God in our lives that it becomes the issue. It's where the weeds of worry take over. So what's taken up residence 
in your heart. Now the good soil. It represents someone that hears God's word, accepts it, applies it, and it ends up producing a good result. It's a posture of saying, Lord, when I come into church on a Sunday morning, let me not just hear your word with my ears, but let my heart receive it. Or when I read the the truth of your word, let me not just see it with my eyes and it doesn't get past the surface of my heart because I want that word to actually get down deep and produce some results. And let us not be religious Christians where we know what to say, but we fail to recognize how to live. It's hearing the truth, receiving the truth, applying it, and allowing God's truth to produce change. In verse 20, it says, And the seed that fell on good soil represents those who hear and accept God's word and produce a harvest of 30, 60, or even 100 times as much as had been planted. What does that mean? 30, 60, 100 times. A lot of theologians, uh, they'll disagree on this particular point. Um, I actually lean with the group that, that shares, when it comes to uh, the numbers that they're drawing out, they're not trying to land on a specific number when it comes to the Word of God producing a result. What the text is meant to say is, when you actually receive God's Word with faith, when you embrace it, when you apply it, there is an exponential spiritual result that happens on the inside. One that goes far beyond what you could possibly imagine. So when you are applying God's word, when you're accepting it as truth, when you're living by the scriptures, it produces a result inside of you that is far more than you could possibly imagine. I remember years ago when I was preaching a message at the church I was on staff with. If you, if you speak or you're a pastor, if you're a communicator in any environment, I don't care if it's church on a Sunday or somewhere else, there are going to be times, I'm just telling you, I feel it some weekends too. There are times where I feel like after I get done speaking the message, like, yeah, I, I, think that was, I think I did pretty well. I think that was a decent message. Then there are some weeks that I'll walk, I'll walk away, I'll go home and I'm thinking, man, I, that was terrible. Like, I, I don't know if anybody got anything from this message. You know, and, I, and I'll beat myself up. I've talked to Lauren about it. Just, you know, where, where it's just like, I, did, God, did you, did you move? Did you do anything? And I remember one weekend I was speaking the, the weekend services, the church I was on staff with, and I had one of those weekends where it just felt like I just blew it. It just, I tanked it. And I, I remember getting off the stage and, and, uh, and I thought, man, I... Lord, I, I, I hope you did something in, in the lives of your people. And then I saw his name was Chris. He was one of our ushers at the church at the time. And he came up to me. He's like, Foster, he goes, man, what a great message. He said, this was awesome. I had three pages full of notes. Now, you would think somebody gives you a nice compliment. You'd be like, oh, man, thank you. And that was so kind of you. My response was this. Really? <laughs> I said, you really got, you got, you got that much out of it? And he said, yeah. He goes, man, I took so many notes. He goes, I, just the Lord spoke to me. And, and, and that's where I, I, I knew a couple things were taking place. And it was, this is, this is helpful for me. It's going to be helpful for you as well. Number one, it, it means that spiritual growth for someone's life doesn't rise or fall on me. And it also means the word of God is far more powerful than at times I give it credit for. You have no idea the kind of result the Word of God can produce in your life if you position your heart in a way to receive it. And I realized in that moment, that man right there represents the good soil. Someone that was ready to accept God's Word, to receive it, and to apply it in his life. Jesus was saying that when those that hear the word of God, they're actually revealed the mystery of the kingdom. What does that mean? It revealed the mystery of the kingdom. Really, it's putting yourself in a position where you hear the word of God in faith. What does that mean, to hear it in faith? It's putting yourself in a position when you hear God's word, 
when you read God's word, you might even say, I'm not even sure, Lord, that I fully understand or comprehend just yet what the word is asking of me or saying to me, but I'm going to build my life on this truth. This is where I'm going to land. I'm going to establish my life on your word. Billy Graham, he told a story about his uh, ministry experience and just there were times in his life where he struggled with some of the things that he would read in God's word or, or, or fully embracing its truth. I think that the longer we serve the Lord, uh, all of us have probably been in seasons where we felt that or experienced that. Listen to what he shares. I've discovered something in my ministry. When I take the Bible literally, when I proclaim it as the word of God, my preaching has power. When I stand on the platform and say, God says, or the Bible says, the Holy Spirit uses me, there are results. Wiser men than you and I have been arguing questions like this for centuries. I don't have the time or the intellect to examine all sides of the theological dispute, so I've decided once and for all to stop questioning and accept the Bible as God's word. Now the point that I'm trying to draw out, even sharing that particular quote from that man's life, is that how you and I position our hearts on a Sunday or how we position our hearts on a Monday through Saturday when we hear, when we read God's word, it makes all the difference. And when it comes to the things of God, always maintain an attitude of humility and teachability. And that's how we want to position our lives. Don't don't approach A church on a Sunday, don't approach the word of God during the week like we've got it all figured out. Uh, we've, we, we've, We've attained our relationship with Christ. We don't have any further to grow. I'm telling you, all of us, we are gonna be a work in progress until we get to heaven. There is never gonna be a time where you're gonna be fully mature. The goal is to continue to grow and look more and more like Jesus, but we're never going to reach perfection but we are keeping our eyes on the one that's perfect. I want to position my life in such a way that I can receive God's word from whoever delivers it, from whoever is communicating. Maybe you've been in this place, uh, if you've been around church for many years, uh, there are times where when the pastor or somebody that, uh, let's say you're at a church and you, you, you enjoyed a certain people that were communicating God's word, There'll be times that you're going to make sure you're there for that weekend. But there are other times, and I've been there too, you know that somebody else is speaking, you're like, that's a weekend I'm going to take off. I don't want to hear that person speak. I don't like them. The, you know, that's a lake day. I don't know. It's just, that's a weekend I'm okay watching online. We've all done it. Don't act like you're super spiritual. But I'm learning over the years, and I want to, I want to put myself in a position where I can learn and, and, and receive from God's word no matter who delivers it. I want to put myself in a place where it's like, Lord, I I just want to be teachable. I want my heart to be good soil. I want you to reveal whatever truth you have for me, whether it's at church on Sunday, whether it's in a Bible study, a small group. Put yourself in a position where you say, God, I'm ready to receive your word, but not just receive it. I'm here to accept it and apply it to my life as truth. And what happens is, when you do that, when the Lord says 30, 60, 100 fold, it means you have no idea the spiritual result of that position of your heart, the result it's going to yield. Exponentially more than you could imagine. So here's the question to ask as we get ready to close. How is your heart positioned to receive God's word? Here's my prayer for us today. It's, Lord, give us the eyes to see the truth in your word. Help us to receive that truth with gladness. And then, Lord, give us wisdom and discernment to know how to apply the truth of your word to our life. Because we desire that our hearts would be good soil where the seeds that are planted would grow and produce a result that's far more than we could possibly imagine. In Jesus' name.